The Arabians had a great interest in math and science. They learned the concept of zero from the Hindus in India and used it to great effect. You'll be very happy to know they invented algebra. The Arabians collected books from all over the world, and during the Dark Ages, while Europe was losing knowledge, it was the Arabians who kept Greek knowledge alive. So, uh, the net effect of this is that you've got uh, human uh, individuals from radically different cultural traditions being thrown into the same crucible. The challenge that greeted these scholars was daunting. The great works of the ancients had to be transformed into a wholly new body of knowledge. Competition for jobs developed within a new intellectual elite. Scholars were dispatched across the empire to locate as many ancient texts as possible. The first international scientific venture in history. Unlike their Christian counterparts, Muslim thinkers saw no insurmountable contradiction between their faith and the laws governing the natural world. So they embraced Aristotle and Plato. From the Hindus came mathematical concepts that guide us today. It was the scholars of the House of Wisdom who developed the system of Arabic numerals, still in use. Now you begin to have what I call the birth of the new Islamic science. Algebra and trigonometry, engineering and astronomy, countless disciplines integral to our lives today trace their roots to Islamic scientists. More surprising, perhaps, were their innovations in medicine. At a time when Europeans were praying to the bones of their saints to cure their illnesses, Muslim physicians developed an innovative theory that disease was transmitted through tiny airborne organisms, the precursor to the study of germs. They determined that sick patients should be quarantined and then treated. This is the basis of the institution most fundamental to medicine today the hospital. Funded mainly through religious endowments, Muslim hospitals had separate wards for patients suffering from different kinds of disease. Even mental illness was treated. Their studies of anatomy were so sophisticated that they remained in use by Muslim and European physicians for 600 years. Muslim scientists were especially intrigued by light, lenses, and the physiology of the human eye. The father of optics was a Muslim named Ibn al-Haytham. His work with lenses eventually led to the invention of the modern camera. He produced the first treatise that ventured to explain how the eye actually sees. A thousand years before the West dared to take up the practice, Muslim doctors were removing cataracts surgically, clearing them from the eye with a hollow needle. But for all this knowledge to transform and illuminate an empire, it had to be copied and shared across a hundred different cities in the Islamic world. For this, there was a new invention one that is still fundamental to learning and knowledge today. Paper. Time for a quick game. On the next slide you'll see three images. Two of them were introduced to Europe by the Arabs, one was not. Try to guess which one wasn't. For this round we have algebra, the concept of zero, and the concept of pi. Two facts, one fiction. Algebra. Fact. 
So, is it pi or zero that is fiction? The answer is pi. The concept of zero is fact. Here's the next three. Chess, polo, and ping pong. And the fiction is ping pong, of course, which came from China. Chess and polo both are Arabian games that came to the West. Next, we will look at the economy of the Arabians. Trade played a huge part in the creation of the Arabic empires. Oh wait, this song rules. Remember the old Burger King commercial with it? Anyway, the empires were located right in the center of the spice, and later the silk trade routes. They were in the middle with Rome on one side and China on the other. Any trade between Rome and China had to pass through Arabia. This meant the Arabs were in control of the trade. There really weren't any other options for traveling this way. There were no airplanes, of course, and there was no way to go by boat that had been discovered yet either. The only other option was to take a route through the north. Problem was, that's where the scary barbarians lived. If they went through Arabia, they might have to pay a tax or two, but at least they could be fairly safe. The European traders would came through Arabia would often learn the Arabic language. Many also converted to Islam. Muslim traders had advantages like lower taxes so it, quite literally, paid to convert. Also, Arabic traders spread their religion to the places they traveled. So, interestingly, much of the growth of the Arabic empire, at least at first, was done mostly peacefully through trade. Jeez. Another time out? Forget it. You're on your own for this one, I'm going to take a break. Traveling alone, without protection, was very dangerous. By converting to Islam the traders felt more safe. Still, bandits and enemy tribes were a constant threat. You also ran the risk of running out of water at any time. If you didn't have a proper guide you could end up lost and wandering. In the desert, everything looks the same. There were wells available, if you knew where to look, but the tribes owned them and rarely shared. If you took water that didn't belong to you, watch out, 